So, week 11. It is February. Uh, Toby Tarrant will be disappointed. <laughs> well, I hope not to, to hear. Um, it's our 11th episode. And following last week, um, normal order has resumed. Now, whether that is seen as a good thing by most people, I feel much more comfortable in this seat than I did in the one I was in last week. Um, but yeah, it was a great experience. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, this week, we will talk uh, slogging at golf day, slogging at cricket 11, um, all the cricket that's coming up, the Pakistan and Sri Lanka first test we'll go through. Uh, BBL, uh, a few things to talk about there, uh, including the final that's coming up, the T10, and a couple of massive gripes that I've got about that. Uh, people who were tuning in on the big smoke, big night in last Friday will have heard about them, so sorry if I am repeating myself, but uh, it needs to be said. Uh, before we go any further, I would like to introduce and welcome again my two glorious, glorious co-hosts, I'm going to come to uh, Simon Simon Roberts first this week. Robbo, how are you, mate? I'm very good, thank you, mate. Um, yeah, although, I mean, I'm not one that's pushing to get you out of the job, but I don't think that introduction was quite as good as Eugene's was last week, which I think, to be fair, Channel 4 have apparently announcing the coverage tonight or tomorrow for the cricket. However, we might not be able to record next week because our producer may well be lead presenter on the channel Four cricket coverage which might be quite interesting for everyone but but no i'm very good thank you mate good uh you just remember you've got to cut that bit out um but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um how are you you i was live back on the uh on the dark side mate yeah it's better to be on the side of the table like you i'm very happy uh, i have uh declined the um the the, the, the channel four job already um i'll, I'll have you know so yeah, there, there's, I've got I've got bigger, higher, and better priorities in the slogging it, and specifically getting really involved in the slogging at golf day at the moment. Yeah, it's taking up a a small amount of time for us. Um, you know, we're in the preparation of creating the flyer. We're getting all the details down. We're contacting people to to come out and tell us whether they're interested in. Obviously, we can we cannot pay anything right now, but we're interested in the names of people that want to come and join us as well as finding more prospective, um, you know, sponsors for holes. So, yeah, the, the golf day is going full steam ahead. And, yeah, I mean, it's it's, great. it's gaining a lot of traction. Absolutely. So that's uh, one one of my jobs ticked off for the night. Yuji's desperately trying to take my seat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I you want me to go about the cricket team and then uh, we can, we can <laughs> so that we're getting here, Yuji, we can slowly wheedle him out the side door. Hold on, Yuji. <laughs> I'm just going to pull you back out of my throat. Hold on, mate. <laughs> Um, so yes, um, we do have the Slogging It Golf Day, 1st of July at the Forest of Arden, a European tour venue from 2020. It's an amazing golf course. Uh, the three of us have got a couple of games around there just to figure out where everything's going to go, where the different um, sponsors are going to go and where the bars are going to go and stuff. So it's all incredibly exciting. Um, as Eugene says, uh, we've probably got, I think we've got quite a few teams uh, booked in already and that's without us actually having formally announced it and some tea sponsors so it's very very exciting uh, it's still plenty of opportunity to get involved so uh, if you want to find out more about that it's uh, info at slogging uk to find out a little bit more uh, as well as that we obviously have the uh, slogging it 11 uh, two games confirmed now for this year but room for another couple uh, so if you and your cricket club would like to get involved and getting us and some of our celebrity friends down to have a game of cricket against you, try and raise a bit of money for the Lord's Taverners, um, and also your club, please do get in touch via that same email address. Um, before we go on, we've got to mention our partners, um, Lord's Taverners, obviously, uh, who you will be uh, very au fait with them by now. Uh, Big Smoke Brewery, uh, very kindly keeping us um, watered more so than fed, uh, but definitely well watered uh, as we go through each week of our uh, recordings, etc., uh, and of course Woodstock cricket. Um, so, uh, first point of order: last week's pod. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm not trying to be a you know all about me, what have you, but you know we, we should we should cover it off. Um, obviously, I, you know as we do every week, I share a fair few messages with you boys, uh, and the reaction again has been absolutely fantastic, hasn't it? Yeah, amazing. Like I said, I think you. I said this at the um, when we closed down the uh, Big Smokes Big Night in the other day when I was finishing that with huge. 
Um, I thought you did really well on it um, to sort of get your point across and to to emotionally go through what you did during it. I thought was 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 good, and it it sort of led the point that we're trying to make through doing this. Um, like say, we've had some amazing messages. You you've sent some around today. Um, incredible messages, and that's what we try and do. We just try and help people, and who it makes them have a look at and an assess about what they're doing and what they're potentially going through. Then that's we're winning, aren't we? We're, we're, we're things are going in the right direction, and I think that's that's all we can keep trying to do. Yeah, absolutely huge. Yeah, it's it's been phenomenal. Um, obviously, being being the you know the the key host on on the show and getting the feedback that you got was was phenomenal. I'm thinking about making like a mural in the background of all the positive stuff that we're getting. Maybe putting that on the website. Obviously, anonymized um, and taking some of the detail out to, to takes it away. But yeah, it's a it's one of those things where you know I think we've said this a couple of times now. It's you know if we affect one person and get some positive, you know, influence on, on, on somebody, then from our perspective, we're doing the right thing. And yeah, fortunately it seems to be, you know, we're getting in the, in the double figures every single week with the messages receiving. So yeah. Um, and again, you know, it takes people like you though, to be able to open up to, to make sure that people feel comfortable in, in sharing those messages. So yeah, it's great. I think one of the things that, I, you know, I've been responding to a lot of messages from a lot of people that I wouldn't have expected to listen to it, you know. Um, I think Sai would have said the same about his. Mm. You get messages from a lot of people you wouldn't necessarily have expect to listen to slogging it. Um, now, whether they've taken an interest in it because it's a personal friend's story that particular week or whatever. Um, but the, I've had so many people reach out to me who are in, you know, who are struggling. Um, you know, one of the ones that I shared with you guys today, like, crikey, like, you know, it's someone who I've always seen as a really strong individual and, and absolutely is a strong individual. But the, the fact that they're now, um, and I think this is what allowed me to do it, having gone through the process and heard a lot of our guests talk about their individual strength, but strength being, you know, the, the ability to talk about stuff openly. Um, that's what gave me the strength to, to then go through that process myself. So um, it really is cathartic. It's therapeutic. Um, so for anybody that's listening to this who may be battling things and, and has maybe so far decided not to try and seek help, look, it will make you feel better. Mm. If you talk to your mate about it or you talk to someone professional, it, 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 it's a, a brilliant experience. I have a question. Do you think it's because of lockdown that we're getting so much feedback? So hypothetically, we're back in the middle of cricket season. People are busy. They're at the pub with their mates. They're talking to people face to face. Do you think we're still going to get the same sort of messages when we're doing this once every two weeks? Because apparently we have social lives and we're not going to be able to record every week. But yeah, just just a question thrown out there. Is it because of lockdown that we're we're, we're getting this positive feedback or do you think it'll continue? I actually personally, uh, I'd be really interested in Simon's point of view on this, but my, from, my, from my own point of view, I think as long as, I think that the, the fact that we started this now and it's given us a run up, people will have an awareness of what we're doing and what we're trying to do. So we'll have built a bit of momentum by the time that happens. So I think whether people will listen to it on a Thursday morning or a Thursday night or whenever, whenever people listen to it, I, still, I think that by the time things maybe relax a little bit, because people are finding value in this, people will make time to listen to it. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 you know, if we are still providing value to people through the messages and the guests and the stories that are being told, and um, people can find help through that in some way, I, I don't, I shouldn't see that um, being any different. Sai, what do you think? I mean, uh, for me, when it comes to the feedback that we get. Um... It's, it, that's not why we do this, by the way. That's no, 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 no. That's that's what I'm going to say. It's not. We, we don't do this to get to for, so we can get a hundred messages of people going thanks. That's not why we do it. If if you like, you say people are back in the pub and people are sat there on a Friday night with all the mates around, and one of them's not feeling great, and he has a conversation with them about it. I, I in the nicest possible way, I don't care if he then texts me and goes, yeah, yeah, yeah thanks you gave me the confidence yeah it's nice it is always nice to get but it's a bit like me and john had a conversation earlier about when people do stuff to get thanks yeah, yeah. That, that's not why we're in this we're in this to raise an awareness mm. to try and get more people having those conversations and i personally don't care whether they're having those conversations with me one of you two the mates in the pub the nan that 
a bloke on the corner, I don't care who you're having the conversation with. It's the fact it's happening, isn't it? Yeah, as long as the conversation's happening. Yes, it's nice to someone to send us a message and goes, and, and it makes it go, makes us sit there and go, oh, do you know what? Yeah, we're doing the right things. And yes, it's lovely to get. And if people want to send us messages saying thank you, great. But if they don't, I don't mind. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, like, that's fine. As long as they're having the conversation and or they're, they're picking up the phone to whoever it might be they're picking up the phone to or, or whatever it is they're choosing to do, whether I'm sitting there writing stuff down, going, right, how can I try and get myself out of this? Whether As long as they're having those processes and and trying to move forward, I, the feedback, yeah, the feedback's great, but... Yeah. It's more about being the catalyst for it, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think that's exactly the reason it. for us to if we're the catalyst for people to try and make positive change on their current situation, if they are struggling, then it doesn't matter whether we find out about it. Like, we, how often do we say it's better to say something and never be thanked than never say anything at all? Correct. That's all what we're doing. Like, you know, yeah. it's it, we never find out that we've helped someone. Like, I'm happy in the knowledge. Like, we already know from the fact that we have had messages that this is making a difference to people and it is helping. So, you know, we've that, that for us is that you know, it, it, why would it change yeah. if we if we doing what we're doing then you'd hope that that will kind of uh remain to be the case um on to cricket now um so we we saw south africa play uh, travel to pakistan um which is an amazing thing for uh, global cricket you know we, we kind of briefly discussed you know pre-test last time um but you know a great win for pakistan forward alam um you know half his time looking at the square leg umpire, but, you know, did it quite successfully, got 100. Uh, and Pakistan ended up riding out winners pretty convincingly in the end. They, that, that they did. Um, yeah, I, I love the way he bats. It reminds me of French cricket, but do you know what? When you score 100, I wish I could play French cricket and score 100. Um, yeah, Pakistan just, you know, applied themselves better and South Africa imploded once again in the fourth innings. Um, you know, they, I, I thought at one stage, and I think we've spoken about this on, on the Big Smoke Big Night in. Um, they were 160 for one, and then unfortunately couldn't put more runs together with with the low. Well, not even I can't even say with the lower order, but with the middle order, because it was that bad. So, but credit to Pakistan, um, first Test match back in Pakistan. Um, you know, they've got a win under the belt. So yeah, positive news for for them. Sad news for South Africa, but hopefully they'll bounce back on Thursday. Thoughts on the pitch? Obviously, you know, probably one of those typical subcontinental wickets. Win the toss back first, and then it, it starts looked, to get. It looked on day one like it wasn't going to last two days, um, but then I don't know whether overnight someone put a heavy roller on it or whatever it was. But day two just looked flat. <laughs> um, it seemed to me like almost losing the toss had done Pakistan a favour. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like. It, the thing is, they've not played. I mean, yes, they play first class cricket in Pakistan and stuff like that, but they've not played first uh, test cricket there for what 10, 11 years. But like, yeah. so the groundsman all of a sudden has perhaps gone from a four day game prep, which we know is very different to a five day game prep, which you know is on television, it's all this kind of stuff. They want to try and make it go. So, and whether it's the same groundsman that did it 10, 12 years ago when they last, we don't know. But for me, a pitch sometimes in test cricket gets, I think, gets hyped up. Like, as long as it's a fair kind of game, which it always is in test cricket, because both teams get two goes on it. Yeah. Like, it's not it's not a one-day game where you'll rock up in the morning and it'll snake around corners. You, you do tend to get two goes. Yeah, some sides, sometimes, some sides, sometimes. Now I need to say get the better end of it. That's a bit like a golf tournament where sometimes if you're out early one morning and the weather's a bit crap compared to like that can happen. But generally over the course of two days in a golf tournament, it, it averages out and the best players at the top and they make the cut. Um, I don't like, I don't like this idea of people constantly going, I like the fact that in world cricket, you go around and you play a test match in Pakistan and you play a test match in Sri Lanka where it might spin from early on. Um, you play in India now where the Indian wickets have changed massively over the 20 years that we've been watching or I've been watching. There used to be absolute dust bowls when they had like Kumble, Harbhajan, all them guys. And now because they've got arguably the best seam attacking, well, it's eight, eight seamers deep goes, 
there's not many better than him. All of a sudden, they're preparing quick, bouncy wickets that are flying through and seaming around a bit. So I like the diversity. I like the fact you go to Australia and it's how it is there and you go to South Africa. Let people prepare their pitches. Um, I, thought, um, I thought the Karachi International Stadium looked an absolute joy, in fairness to it. Like, I, I mean, obviously, the, t- the TV quality now is miles better than last time would have been. Able, it was last time we'd have been able to watch yeah. any kind of cricket in Pakistan. But I thought the pitch and the ground looked sensational. Yeah. Um, I, I thought, it looked, you know, the outfield was lush and green. The wicket looked decent. Um, Yasir Shah is always going to be a handful. Um, Shaheen Shah Afridi, I think, only continues to impress. Yeah. Um, you know, I felt a bit sorry for Rory Burns in the summer. I mean, he just nicked him. He just bowled beauty after beauty to him and just kept nicking him off at that fourth stump line, didn't he? Um, but yeah, so that's um, that's uh, the second test, obviously, due to start uh, Thursday or today. Yeah. I believe. One, one, one thing I will say about that is there's been a couple of times in COVID that I wish there'd been crowds. Yeah. Um, obviously, our summer you had Broad and Anderson getting 500 and 600 wickets, respectively. Like, that's nice with the crowd. Um, I was watching darts, ironically, just before Christmas, and there was a guy from Brazil. He's the first ever player from Brazil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he won. He won the first round match. And you could see he bosh, broke down in tears on the stage at Alexandra Palace. And you just go, God, I wish there was 10,000 people in there going absolutely yeah. ballistic for him. And that, that first test back in Pakistan. You, we all know what the Pakistan fans are like and all, all that kind of stuff would have been an Passionate. absolute event and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's just things like that that I'm, you kind of imagine watching. I don't think any of us would have turned it off. I got a bit bored at sometimes with it when that, on that day two when, like you say, Fawad Alam um, was doing whatever he was doing, facing whatever direction he was facing and gunning it for 100. But... It was just like, oh, yeah, because you haven't got the up and down of the crowd and everything that makes Test cricket, especially in those passionate countries. Yeah. So good. But that's. Uh, talking of passionate fans in um, subcontinental cricketing countries, uh, we heard today that uh, the fir- the two tests in Chennai, which are the first two tests, are going to have fans. Um, Amazing. Members. Members only for the first test and uh, then 50% capacity for the second test. I then got in touch with a friend of mine who works in cricket in India um, and asked about the kind of COVID situation in India and it would seem like it's improving. Um, And considering that they thought it was travelling around India like wildfire, how they've got fans in before we have, um, they're obviously doing something right. Uh, But I think that's that's amazing for test cricket and I think... England players will enjoy being able to play with a bit of atmosphere again, uh, as, as of course will the Indian lads. Huge. Yeah, it's it's um, it's going to be great. I actually didn't know that. Um, that this is news to me. So you are in the know before me, which is always the case, as your JC uh, JG Cricket Badger name upholds. So from that perspective, well done. Um, yeah, I, anything with fans with the stadium until it gets back. I mean, the only thing I'd say is the reason we didn't have it over here, if I'm really honest, is because we still had it, you know, we were still in early days trying to figure out what's going on. I think now, you know, there's more of a protocol, there's more of an understanding, therefore it'll be better. We Let's talk about England, the England side. What what do we think the makeup's going to be of that side? Do we think um, Burns is going to come back in? Do we think Pope's going to come in? Obviously, you'd expect Stokes to come in. Who's going to drop out, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yes, Burns comes back in. Pope, for me, comes back in if fit. But that's the big one. Stokes comes back in. And you're looking at Lawrence, unfortunately. Um, purely because of, uh, I think he looked good against spin. But when the seam was bowled, I don't think he looked anywhere near. Yeah. Um, at the minute. He's obviously done well in England on English wickets, so he can obviously play a moving ball. But I just think compared to Pope, if you look at Pope's record recently, it's not a not even a fair fight. Um, obviously, England's team makeup will change dramatically with Stokes coming into that five or six role, wherever they thing. Have a look at batting. The big one for me is whether Bairstow carries on playing. Um, or well, he's not done, has he? He's not there for the first oh, game. So, so Crawley goes into three. Burns opens the batting, root bats at four, Stokes five, Pope six, Butler seven for the first game, and then you'll go. It'll be one of the spinners. 
I, I don't think those wickets that I don't think they they'll spin, and I think they'll use Joe Root. So I think they'll actually pick Leach as a left armour, knowing they've got Root as the right armour, and they'll bat Broad Anderson. <laughs> yeah. I think they'll be Broad, Anderson, Leach, and Arch. Arch. Yeah. Right. Well, there you go. Any um, any advance on that, Eugene Berger? Um, no, no advancements on that. The only debate might be is I think they'll pick Curran. Do you think? I think they'll pick Curran to bat at eight. Who's the best at reverse swing? Pick them. I don't know who that is, by the way. Would Would you'd say on the basis of the last one, but. I mean, look, look how the ball was they're swinging. Gonna, they're not going to pick Broad, Archer, Anderson and Wood. No chance. No. Not with strokes in the side. Um, I think the thing, the thing with Curran is, you'd say that one of the reasons to pick a left arm is to create footholds for the off spinner to utilise. But then if they're not going to pick Don Best, then that, that's kind of a, a bit pointless anyway, isn't it? Yeah, I just, I can't, I, I think they like him. I think they like what he offers in that side at number eight as a, a left arm option, as much as it irritates the cack out of me that you pick someone to run on the right side of the pitch, but just bowl around the wicket. Like if that's the case or whatever, like, yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I think they like Curran. I think Silverwood and the coaching staff like Curran, whether they go broad and Anderson for in the same test, I, I don't know. So that you're then looking at how they, they balance it and, I think if Broad and Anderson, their batting attack, with their, their batting lineup, I think if you can go Broad and Anderson with a new ball and not give him a sniff, mm. you can then put a lot of pressure on. Yeah. And yeah. we've seen Broad and Anderson recently are going at less than, oh, worst case scenario, two and a half and over. So I, as much as Curran, yeah, he offers a left arm option, like all this kind of stuff. I think you've got some X Factor bowlers. Stokes reverses it. I don't know. I don't know. I've just uh, I've just gone on to our uh, WhatsApp group to see. I sent a photo, didn't I, from um, the other day about where Pajara wore it on yeah. the uh, on, yeah. on the day in Brisbane. So uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine balls, with the lowest being one hundred and thirty-five, and the highest being one hundred and forty-two, all hitting. One lowest was kind of thigh, and the rest of them were anywhere in between. Elbows, gloves, lid, shoulder. Like, the bloke's a machine. Like, I think, you know, when you're getting beaten up, and that is getting beaten up, to have your mental strength at a level where you can just go, nah, on we go, on we go. Like, fair play to the lad. Like, I think it's England have got a tough job dislodging him, um, you know, four, four or five, four tests, isn't it? So they've got to get him out eight times. Which isn't going to be easy. I think that um, I think the Indian batting lineup looks so strong. You know, yeah, yeah. The, the, the challenge, well, maybe the challenge, I think England are going to go batting heavy and pick less bowlers. That's what I think they're going to do because of the of the wickets that, that, that are going to be there. So I think they're going to try and load up with batting because they're going to have Stokes back now. They're going to use Stokes as that extra bowler. So I wouldn't be surprised if we would see two seamers, two spinners and Stokes. Wow. I mean, the thing with it, I mean, we've seen England playing India before and get 600 in the first day only for India to get 700 and then India, England to get bowled out, you know, cheaply in the in the third, haven't we? Like, you know, I don't think you're never safe. Even if you get five or 600 in the first dig in India, it's, the game's not done. No, I think the one thing we've seen about this Indian batting lineup is because it's very, other than Pajara, it is quite positive. Even people like Rahani, although he's not what you call a whacker, he's positive. Kohli's he's very positive. positive. He used to be a bit of a blocker, didn't he? But yeah. now he's... We've seen like when they got bowled out for 36, like they're not infallible. But yeah. like you, 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 I mean, that doesn't happen very often. Um, I, I, I think I don't disagree with what you're saying, Huge, which is why, again, I think they'll might pick a Curran or a Wokes or a, someone like that in that to bat at eight, potentially even pick someone to bat at a, a batter to bat at seven. That, that way, Lawrence might get in, mm. and then you pick Stokes and Root as your two other bowling options. You go, keep then. 
Butler, uh, Butler keeping first test, isn't he? And then Folks comes in and bats at seven or eight for the last three. The last three, yeah. Like, I mean, I, I, there's there's so many options and it just depends. You'd say they're going to pick one of Archer and Wood, one of Broad and Anderson. So there's two of your ones and then it's a case of I'd go Leach. If you, if you, unless you want to pick best to bat at eight because he can bat. Not that you look like yeah. you're going to be able to get a running tranker, but... Well, we shall see, shall we not, gentlemen? We shall see. Um, starts on Friday, uh, the first test. Um, so we want to now move on to a, a bit of other, a few bits of other cricket that are um, going on in the world at the minute. Big Bash. Now, uh, the Sydney Sixers are in the final. Uh, we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, the Heat will play the Scorchers in the kind of final eliminator. Sam Heasler was 19 off 25 balls. I watched this yesterday and then ended up 74 not out, I think, of 48 balls. Just absolutely took off. When Chris Lynn was out, um, and then who, there was another fellow that he was batting with for a while. Anyway, it, unbelievable, the turnaround, because they were saying, oh, I, you know, need to start, you know, doing something here. Oh, Pearson. Yeah, the keeper. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is Pearson, yeah. Uh, it, it came in and played a, an amazing knock as well. And they, they were nowhere. Like halfway, you know, eight, nine overs in, they were dead. Um, but what a turnaround and what a performance from them two that was. Um, so, yeah, they will now go and play um, the Perth Scorchers. It was due to be in Perth, but then because of restrictions COVID-wise in Western Australia, they're having to play it in Canberra. Um, so that means none of them are going to have to travel. I think the, the Heat are quite happy about that because that then makes it, uh, they don't have to, you know, I think. They, it's they a neutral to, game now. Mm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, but yeah, so that'd be an entertaining game. Obviously, Liam Livingston and Jason Roy playing and opening the batting for the Perth Scorchers. On to the Sixers. Uh, only the one Englishman who's done reasonably well for him this year, James Vince, 98 not out. Uh, need one to win. Andrew Ty bowls the, the filthiest, most Australian fucking. <laughs> an Englishman thing to do I've ever seen I mean is it, he must have been part of the test side or something he must be like roommates with David Warner or something what a shit bloke have a day off if he if James Vince wasn't English he would not have done that and then he goes up and apologises he knows exactly what he was doing that's a shit man's trick uh, on, on like, on like the um, Steve Smith stuff I full, fundamentally agree with you Jono uh, yeah it's it's just rubbish. Uh, I mean, the only way that his team are going to win that game or stand a chance in that game is if he gets him out. Mm. So he's solely going in. If you And if he wants to say, I'm going to get him out, he's going to get full and straight. And he's a good enough bowler. Andrew Ty is one of the best death bowlers there is in world cricket at the minute. Yeah, exactly. Not like you said. You went, oh, he probably just bowled a bad ball. No, mate. He, no, he knew what he was doing. So, so I, I just think in general, like... I've had, I've seen people do it in games. Like I, I just think it's, it's awful. It's just just it's a horrible, horrible admission of absolute defeat. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. It's I'm just... not good enough. Yeah. The worst thing about it, you're basically saying I'm not good enough. We haven't been good enough, but I'm not letting you have anything. Yeah. And it's, it's just horrible. It, it's just horrible. Yeah, it's I'm not great. Huge, even if he didn't do it on purpose, I think the attempt to bowl it is an absolute shock because it's not even close. It's gone past the batter at about fifteen foot high and off the pitch. It's yeah. not. It's not snuck. It's not trying to bump him normally, and it's just snuck in at like ear height or something. He may as well have ran in and thrown it. That I mean, just run in and throw it over third man. Yeah. Like, Awful. Yeah. Well, it's not great. It's yeah. Eugene he just made a mistake. Had, he just made a simple mistake. Yeah, he made a simple mistake. <laughs> you guys, you guys I'm, I'm right. trying to get a word in your edgewise. You guys are just absolutely sledging me. I feel like I feel like poor <laughs> Andrew Ty right now <laughs> from all the abuse I'm sure he's got from 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 all corners of the earth and social media. The poor lad. <laughs> You're one of the nicest blokes I know. But now twice you've argued with me about Australians, and yeah. I feel like it's going to be a fall, the fallout's on the cartoon. 
<laughs> oh, who, who knows? Only he will know. Um, you know, the only equivalent that I can say is it's possibly like uh, Patrick Reed, the golfer. That's all I can say. Don't get me started on him again. <laughs> I, mean, that well, I, I thought you were going to say the only thing it can be compared to is when they bowled it bleeding underarm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Patrick, Patrick Reed, he's another one. Don't do not get me started on him. Anyway, right. T10. Now I mentioned I mentioned this on uh, Friday during the big smoke big night in some absolute weapon, right? Who's bowling filthy flat round arm non spinning shit bags was running into bowl with his cap on backwards. What are you doing? Uh, Seriously, what are you I doing? Did, I did see that, that. Is, that is totally unacceptable in league cricket. It's totally unacceptable in friendly cricket. It's like that backwards on the golf course. It's not allowed. Stop it. This guy is a professional cricketer. Well, maybe, maybe he's not. Let's no, just be clear about that. Yeah, he, he might not be. I mean, just had a conversation with uh, with next week's guest today, who's out there at the minute. Um, it, there's every chance he might not be a professional cricketer. So bringing him to disrepute. And I've done that enough, and I get in trouble all the time for it. So he should get in trouble for this. To be fair, there was a few years ago when Workstop Cricket Club in our, in the Nottinghamshire League had a an uh, an Asian guy come over, and he bowled. He ran in from miles away, and he was quick, and he bowled with his cap on backwards. And I mean, not many people said anything to him. He also showered in his underpants, which, to be fair, got more comments after the game than. Uh, <laughs> Than him actually bowling in a cap, but that each to their own. But um, but yeah, so I have seen it before, and like we did say, a lot of the girls do it um, to keep their hair out of the face and stuff when they bowl. Uh, not many of them wear it backwards, however, I will give you that. But um, yeah, it's it, mm, right. Yeah. I, I, I do it. I do it in LMS. You haven't got any hair. But uh, the, the sun's in my eye. I, I wear it backwards because I want. <laughs> I wear it backwards when I'm bowling. If the sun's in your, your eyes, eyes where's face in your way? Because you can't give it to the umpire. You can't what? give it. You can't give it to the umpire because of COVID pro protocols. So what are you going to oh, do? That's a good point. I get that. Well, they can. They can give it to a teammate. Oh, they cool. Well, yeah. Yeah, but you can't say you wear your cap backwards because the sun's in your eyes. Because that when makes I'm fielding. Sense. Yeah, when I'm fielding, the sun's in my eyes. When I'm bowling, it's not. Right. So when I'm bowling, what am I going to do? You know how LMS is. Everyone's on the boundary. Am I going to give my cap to someone? No. I just put it on backwards. Put it behind the stumps, Huge. No, because then if it hits it, it's five runs. Right, Eugene's obviously on one tonight. He's just <laughs> refusing to agree with anything I say. He's got my caffeine blitz from the other week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. The other thing um, that's a real WTF for me at the moment, and I'm really angry about this as well, and it's awful, and it's been creeping into the game for ages, now, I remember when I was growing up, we're all a similar age. You used to, in between overs, you used to go and have a chat with your mate, and then you'd turn around and you'd say, right, see you in five minutes, if you're lucky enough to make it through the next six balls. right? Then the old kind of glove punch came in, and we did that for a few years. Now they're taking chunks out of the back of each other's sodding bats, then then doing the glove punch. What well, we're gonna we're gonna be doing the fucking hokey cokey next. <laughs> <laughs> That's when he's going to take about three and a half hours because they're doing a Morris dance before they say goodbye to each other in between each over. I've got this really funny image now of uh, because I'm I'm of an age where we used to have a summer fete. I live in a village in Nottingham as well, and that makes me sound awfully middle class. But when I was a kid, we used to do maypole dancing at the summer fete, and I've got this really <laughs> funny image now of like in between over. It's like some NFL like breaking play where all of a sudden these blokes come on with a pole and multicolored <laughs> exactly. bells on. Yeah, I mean, why is it? It's ridiculous. It's uh, absolutely it's, stupid. It's something that is coming to the game, and I completely understand why it's coming to the game, especially as batters. You come in, it's you two against everyone else, and I, I understand some of it. I understand some of it, but. The amount I think it leads on to another thing, which is the amount of time cricket is now taking to play a game. And that is becoming ridiculous. T twenty used to be an hour and fifteen minutes. And like Luke Sutton said, when they played their first ever T twenty, 
Dominic Corbyn yeah. made them run, run, like sprint through, and it took them fifty minutes to bowl. Like when they used to play cricket on uncovered pitches in the forties and fifties, and whenever Jeff Boycott was playing, like he bangs on about it enough. They used to bowl at twenty-one overs an hour. Mm. Like, yes, the game has changed, but I think here is a fundamental. There's there's things that are coming into the game that mean it's taking longer and longer and longer. While some of it entertaining, I think some of it needs to be curtailed a little bit. I think what needs to be brought in is a time limit between overs. And it used to have to be the rule that the batter used to have to be ready for the bowler. That used to be yeah, yeah, yeah. always told. And at the minute now, well, I don't even know if in T10 they are ready because there's a mother's meeting between every ball, but that's because every ball's a massive drama. Yeah. Um, so that's this week in cricket. Um, hope you've enjoyed our uh, little grump off uh, between the three of us. Um, we recorded, gents, an amazing interview with Simon Hughes, the cricket analyst uh, who people will know from uh, a great pro career, but now broadcasting, etc. cetera. Um, and so after a short note from the Lord's Taverners, uh, you will hear an interview from him. But we would be remiss not to remind you of the um, donation text number for the Lord's Taverners. That, again, as we tell you every week, is tabs11270331, and that will offer them a donation of £3, a brilliant charity offering all disadvantaged and disabled children a sporting chance in life. So please do continually support them. Um, and here's the interview with Simon Hughes. Enjoy. The Lord's Taverners is the UK's leading youth cricket and disability sports charity. We break down barriers and empower disadvantaged and disabled young people to fulfil their potential and build life skills. Our cricket programmes support some of the most marginalised and at-risk young people in the UK, using sport and recreation to build links and encouraging groups to play sport together. We tackle issues such as knife crime, unemployment, radicalisation and also isolation, something we are all feeling right now. Last year, our programmes impacted the lives of more than 12,000 young people and, with your support, will help even more in the future. Find out more and make a donation at lordstaverners.org and help us to continue our life-changing work. Thank you. Uh, thank you again and, as always, to our charity partners, the Lords Taverners. Uh, very, very excited to welcome our guest this week. A voice that, as soon as he came on, took me back to probably 2005 when, as a youngster, I used to watch him avidly uh, during that the most famous of Test series uh, when England hosted Australia. Uh, the well broadcasting legend uh, that is Mr. Simon Hughes. Welcome, Simon. Oh, it's great to be here. Actually, and I think the voice has got a bit deeper and more crackly over time. But <laughs> there we are. That's what happens in life, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, just so for people that are aware, we'll talk to Simon tonight about his uh, outstanding uh, career as a as a fast bowler. Uh, we'll then move on to his journalism career and then finish off covering it as we do some mental health issues. So where did where did cricket start for Simon Hughes? It started uh, it started in Ealing, and uh, it's quite a funny story. Uh, I was mucking about in the back garden with my dad. He was interested in cricket, but not a aficionado or anything, not a particularly good player. And we were playing around in the back garden when I was about eight. And it, it so happened, actually, the back garden was about 22 yards long, funnily enough, so we could just about fit a pitch in. But, you know, we played all sorts of games. And one day we were mucking about with a cricket bat and a tennis ball. And there was this screech from uh, 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 the distance, which sounded like a cat being strangled. I said, Rah! like that. And I thought, that's weird. And it was from the, you know, it was from sort of up the road. So anyway, we carried on with the, with the game. And then 20, 20 minutes later, it happened again, the same sort of screeching noise. And so we thought, well, that's weird. Um, better go and see what that is. And it, it turned out that it was at the top of the road was a cricket club, which we'd actually never been in before. And there was a match on, it was a Saturday, and the, the noise was actually coming from a very tall, ginger-haired fast bowler appealing for LBW. <laughs> uh, and we just kind of got interested and watched the game for a bit, and it had a lovely atmosphere, an old cricket club with a traditional pavilion and seats around and an old scoreboard, and it just looked really nice. We just got into it a bit, and we went back the next day and watched another game, and then... 
it turned out that, uh, you know, they had a cult section. And uh, we sort of thought, well, that sounds interesting. And then they said, well, how old are you? So we said, well, eight, eight or nine or something. We, we don't take cults until 12. So that was a bit disappointing. And so we went back and kind of carried on playing in the garden. And I played in the garden for the next couple of years and played a little bit of primary school. And then when I got to 11, my dad said, come on, let's see if we can join that club. So we went up the road and they said, how old are you? And I said, 12, when actually I was 11. <laughs> and they said, OK, you can join. So I joined. And he actually joined as well and became a coach for 40 years. Wow. Oh, amazing. Uh, and that was the start of it, really. Was that Ealing Cricket Club? Yeah. Oh, wow. So, I mean, Simon, well, three of us have uh, real good friends who play there. Um, uh, you know, what a fantastic club Ealing Cricket Club is. Uh, so it's... Hello, Halty and uh, Ollie and the rest of the boys down yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Marie um, Marie Holt, of course, who is a coach there. Yeah. Yeah, so so her, her son, David, is a good friend to the three of us. Uh, so yeah. you yeah. plays at Twickenham. I, I played at Wimbledon for a long time. And Simon um, knows them all through golf and having played probably MCC young cricketers with them. So um, talking of Middlesex, uh, you were at Middlesex. Great career there playing with people like Phil Tufnell and Angus Fraser and what have you. One of a number of titles. What do you think in that era um, your team had that others didn't to allow you to have been so successful? Brilliant players, number one. A desire to win, a sort of winning mentality. Because, uh, you know, that sounds obvious. But when I then went and played for Durham after my Middlesex career, I was amazed that a lot of the players I played with for Durham who were either locals or from Gloucestershire or North Ants or, you know, recruited from other counties, they didn't have that win mentality at all. They just wanted to play and have fun and enjoy it. And if you won, it was a bonus. But at Middlesex, winning was not the only thing, but a very important thing. And uh, we were driven by, firstly, a fantastic captain in Mike Brearley, who obviously was an England captain, England captain and was very good at motivating different characters. You know, he just had understood people and could sort of figure out what everybody needed to... You know, for instance, he would put a rocket up one person's uh, backside if they weren't performing, uh, or, you know, like, uh, i.e. me. Sometimes he'd <laughs> give me a rocket. But then I, I loved his way of coaxing Wayne Daniel, the Barbadian fast bowler, to, to give him another three overs towards the end of a long day by saying to him, if you give me another three overs, Diamond, I'll introduce you to that barmaid in the Lord's Tavern <laughs> after the game. So, you know, it, it's sort of different kind of tactics. And um, that, 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 was the, that was the reason we were good. I think also probably playing at Lord's, you sort of know that there's going to be prominent people there watching. Mm. So, you know, there's always the chairman of selectors or uh, some other prominent person might be a famous actor you know there's always someone there that you you could sort of do a kind of bit of a put on a bit of a show to so you know a combination of those things really can you explain to us how it feels to have the you know the the dressing room of all dressing rooms and the the kind of um working environment of all working environments if you're a cricket lover or a cricket fan as your home or your your regular place of work to walk through the gray skates every day to go to work must be must be incredible yeah, it, it, it was. I think that you don't really take it in when you're a player. You, you you sort of take it for granted, really, because it it becomes your home and a familiar place. <laughs> they don't always let you in. I, there was a actually um, there was a character that I played with early on, uh, a young wicketkeeper called Chris Goldie, who sort of had a part time job delivering vegetables in a van. And sometimes he'd pick me up and take me to Lords for practice or whatever, you know, and try and drive into the Grace Gates on a non-match day for practice, and they wouldn't let him in because they see this van, which was in a pretty bad state, full of uh, sort of old rotting vegetables and fag packets, not nothing to do with me. And you, you know, he'd say you you can't come in, he wouldn't let in. So <laughs> it had a kind of an, an austere nature to it as well as being your home, and I think just. Just walking out to play at Lords is very special, actually. Um, even if there's nobody there, it is it is a special place. So there's no doubt. Even though you do take it for granted, you do realise how lucky you are 
and I think there's things like little uh, trimmings like uh, the tea trolley wheeled in at, at 410 just laden with luxurious sandwiches and cakes and the food there the food incredible. there was absolutely amazing uh, and the, the <laughs> things like the shower heads were the size of dinner plates you know you could sort of you could really luxuriate in a massive bath yeah. you know ba- ba- you know which was the size for a king you know so there were just little kind of extras like that i suppose which also made it special really it it does sound like and uh, hopefully one day i i get to um not play there, but hopefully visit it more often. Um, so, yeah, looking back at um, your, your first of all publishing career, and, and I was doing some research on you, and I found that you, I think you've released your 10th book now, A New Innings, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Very good um, research. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that was, it's a departure, actually. Um, I, you know, obviously most of my books have been about, largely about me and the, and the people I've met. But... This one is about the business of cricket. And it's about the economics of the game. It focuses on the IPL, which I took a lot of interest in as soon as it began because a great friend owned a team, uh, Manoj Badali, who owns the Rajasthan Royals, and kind of enlisted me to help a bit with it. In fact, he got involved in the IPL partly through me because we created a programme the year before which was a cricket version of Pop Idol to find okay. to find young talent in India. And we did actually do a programme for about 10 weeks, which ran on Indian TV. And as a result of that, he, met, he heard about the IPL and met some of the people setting it up and bought a team. So I then got involved in helping him assemble that team. And I've always taken a big interest in the tournament ever since. I mean, I thought it was a fantastic idea. I went to the first ever game, which was an extraordinary experience. And I I was a pundit on ITV for seven or eight years on the IPL as well. So it's always been something of fascination. And I love India as well. Anyway, so we put together a book, which which is sort of essentially the learnings from the IPL, the innovations it's brought in and what the rest of the cricket world and sports world can learn from it, really. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting... I, I'm personally going to go and have a look at it myself. But on that research, just going back to cricket, I noticed in there that it told us a little bit about you, and that's specifically saying that you won nine titles. Is that correct? Yeah. Which of those nine titles did you? Which, which is your most cherished? I mean, how do you choose from nine? Um, well, I mean, the championships are, I suppose, the the most rewarding county championship titles. You know, it's a whole season. Which one of those is a bit difficult to say, actually. I suppose probably 90, well, maybe the first one, because I, I sort of came into the team late after university had finished and was sort of straight into the team. And that team, that 1980 team was pretty good. Uh, but because it, I think at times I was the only non-international playing in it. Wow! Uh, certainly, in the in the eighty-five uh, championship winning team, I think that was definitely true. Um, so th- those those are special, but the best performance, I suppose, was probably my nineteen eighty-six Benson Hedges final performance when on a helpful pitch, you know, big day. A packed house, big audience on telly. We played very well during the tournament. Uh, I came on to bowl following two internationals, Norman Cowns and Wayne Daniel against Kent, and didn't let the team down, got early wickets, um, and then had to bowl the final over with something like 12 to win. And it was pouring rain and really difficult conditions. And I managed to sort of hold my nerve and... Uh, Although my third ball was hit for six, um, I managed to kind of keep a grip on myself and keep a grip on the ball, despite it feeling like a bar of soap. (laughs) And we won by three runs, I think. So I guess that was from a sort of one moment in time, that was a highlight. But winning winning championships is is an amazing feeling because it takes all season and you, you have so many sort of ups and downs during it. And it's... It's a, it's a great it's a, it's an expedition really. Um, when we were just talking about the IPL there, and I've I'd be really interested to get, see your understand your view on 
how the game's moved forward since you finished playing. Obviously, we'll go into your kind of more journalistic career in a minute. Um, the hundred really interests me, and I'd be really keen to get your view on it. I, a lot of people have said that you know maybe the English invented T20, but then didn't do enough with it, and the rest of the world maybe took it and ran with it. Is there? Um, I quite like the idea of the hundred, but is it? Is, are we trying to fulfil the the almost the need to have in, invented something else that we can then call our own? Yeah, I think that's. I think that thing that is a good way of putting it. Actually, I, I mean, funnily enough, I'm partly guilty for the hundred because. Uh, when I was watching my youngest son play cricket under 13s about five years ago, these matches starting at six o'clock on uh, an April night were finishing at nine o'clock in the pitch dark and the freezing cold. Everyone was mm. getting fed up and they were 20 over games. So someone mm. came up with the inspired idea of 16 overs a side with four over blocks from one end okay. so that the fielders weren't all wandering about changing spots every you know, two, two or three balls and all that. And suddenly these games are over in two hours, 16 overs a side, uh, without switching ends every over. And I thought, well, that's brilliant. So actually, believe it or not, I went to the ECB in 2015 and I said, look, you know, T20 is starting to take a long time. Um, you know, games are finishing middle of the night, uh, both here and abroad. Here's, a, here's an idea. 16 overs is 96 balls. Why don't we create a tournament which is about, which is called 100, which is the 100. Yeah. 100 balls and I called it the 100 ball challenge I think and I sort of left it with them anyway and explained how it worked and heard nothing for about three years until suddenly I heard them announcing they would launched the 100 <laughs> um, and so you know what is my view of it I, I think that we you know one of the reasons ECB brought it in is because they do want to own something and they didn't do enough with T20 or absolutely right it was like the Indians grabbed the ball and ran away with it and did the what England should have done with it, really. Although it's a different market, there's a you know there's a billion people in India. The weather's fantastic. Mm. They're all uh, cricket mad. Whereas obviously here it's a harder sell. So you know they had a ready-made audience in India, but we could have done more with T20, which we did invent. In fact, I played it in the 80s, both at school and club, on a Thursday yeah. night. And you know I remember a, a Durham member writing to me a few years ago, saying we used to play 2020 cricket in the 1930s, or somebody that he knew did anyway, clubs yeah. did. So, you know, it's, it, it's something that we did need to to create a new thing to own it. I mean, it's all about ownership now, because once you own something, you can sell it and mm. brand it, and, you know, you then retain some return. So, you know, it goes back to my interest in the economics of the game. Mm. But... Mm -hmm. You know, I, unfortunately, I'm not convinced that we do need a new format in a way. I mean, unfortunately, the problem with T20 is it's been so successful that it's now taking a long time. And the reason it's taking a long time is because there's a lot at stake. There's, yeah. there's a lot of winnings and career opportunities at stake. So every ball, it becomes an event yeah. and needs a certain amount of analysis and planning for. So therefore, the whole thing takes too long. With the, um, the the strength of the IPL, certainly, and, you know, uh, I just want to ask, kind of take that back to Test Cricket a second, for a second. Um, the Gabba, not only, not a week ago, um, we, we discussed on a podcast uh, last week about the strength of Indian cricket now and the strength of their Test side. They, they could be immense, you know, for a number of years because their youngsters are now beginning to cut their teeth in a competition where they're playing in front of 60, 70, 80,000 people with the best players in the world, has that as the IPL and the success of the IPL almost put India so far ahead of anybody else in the in world cricket because of their youngsters being able to to compete with these guys at such a young age? Well, actually, uh, I've done a, a, a podcast on that. My my own podcast, the Analyst Inside Cricket, is one that we try and think of themes for. And one week, about a year ago, we did: Can India be the new Australia? or the new West Indies from the 80s, or the Australians from the 90s. And, you know, if you think about it, the, firstly, they've got more players than anybody else by miles. But the main thing is they've now got the resources. They've now got A, money, and B, yeah. grounds. So, you know, I, I mean, the grounds they've created, Nagpur, for instance, which was a 
rotting sewer of a ground with stank and was terrible to play at. You know, just an absolute rough, ragged pitch and a ropey outfield where you got you know burns from diving on it and all that, and probably had to have a tetanus injection. <laughs> Calcutta, Calcutta was the same. I played it at the Eden Gardens in Calcutta in the 1980s, and it was in a shocking state. And now, you know, Nagpur, magnificent, ranchy, superb. The, the ground where Dhoni comes from, you know, absolutely superb. Rajkot, which has got a, a replica Lord's Media Centre st- atop of it, you know, Ahmedabad, where they just created a 100,000 stadium. Amazing. And, 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 and outfields like billiard tables, you know, whereas they were rutted and sandy and you, you ricked your ankle on them and, you know, the ball kind of jumped up into your face and all that. Now they can, fielders can dive and, and actually field properly. And the, the other thing that's done, that, 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 that it's created great practice facilities as well, gymnasiums, you know, all the facilities you need to, to become a, a top cricketer. Also... It's created opportunities for players from not the big cities, not the traditional Delhi, Mumbai, Chennai, Calcutta. You know, these grounds growing up in Rajkot, Ranchi, Dharamshala, Nagpur, Ahmedabad, you know, they're drawing in all the players, the talent from these outlying cities, which are still big, by the way. Pune, you know, I went to Pune a couple of years ago Magnificent stadium there. What is it? About three hour drive from De- from Mumbai, from Mumbai, you know. And you think, oh, it's probably a small. It's quite about five million people. You know, it's quite a big city. <laughs> it takes about an hour to drive across it, yeah. and there's so much talent there that they're now nurturing because of the facilities they've got. So, yeah, I, I mean, they, they they should be the best team in the world, um, and and they probably will be. Absolutely, and uh, yeah, I mean, we've seen some of the some of the results go go that way. Moving on to your journalism career, um, in 1992, you know, you you retired from cricket. Um, was journalism always something you wanted to go into? Did you fall into it? How how, how did that come about? Yeah, I started writing when I was 21, actually, on on the game. Uh, somebody came up to me uh, when I'd played a year for Middlesex. Uh, a guy from Ealing, uh, who was the sports editor of the Ealing Gazette, and he said, do you fancy doing a column in the paper? So I said, yeah, and we called it really cheesily, Simon Says. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, and I did that every week. And the players, the Middlesex players, found it quite intriguing that whereas most of them were, uh, in when Middlesex were batting, they'd be sleeping, looking at, Penthouse magazine, smoking, <laughs> um, playing cards, you know, that kind of thing. I would be scribbling down some notes in a, in a book, uh, just observations from the dressing room or the game of some kind. And they, they found it quite intriguing. Why was I doing that? Anyway, it, though, those, I was making notes for my column. And I got a bit of stick for some of the things I wrote, but it was a small, tiny little newspaper eating gazette. So... You know, it was fairly anonymous. Uh, then I kind of gra- graduated to the Cricketer magazine. And then when the independent newspaper was launched in the late 80s, I applied to work for them and got a job there in the winter. And it sort of really took off from there. And I started writing more and more columns from the inside, uh, the dressing room sort of stuff. So in a way, it was <laughs> it was like the first social media, you know, a leak from inside the dressing room. And um, <laughs> the, uh, th- that, was, that stuff I did was invaluable because I kept all those notebooks. And then that enabled me to write a lot of Hard Yakka, which is my sort of quite successful book. Yeah. And it was, it, it, the, the great thing about those notes from, in those books is, firstly, it, it's obviously stuff you've forgotten. And secondly, if you read them, it takes you back to that place where you wrote them and... and suddenly you can picture it all and you, and rem- you, re- you remember other things. So taking notes is, would be my number one tip for anybody who wants to write a book about you know, sport, really. Obviously, you, you mentioned there a couple of the people that you've... Uh, the, the papers, which seems pretty much to be every major newspaper 
in the sort of western speaking world um but um a lot of people say you hear a lot about uh, journalists and more television basically about it they seem to leave one team when they finish playing sport and into another when they go on to telly mm -hmm. um is that the same with within the written press where you do you feel like you're part of that team in nature or or is it slightly different because you're writing your own articles you're writing for your paper you've got to sell your own thing mm -hmm. I think it varies, actually. I, I mean, I didn't... Did I feel part of it? The thing is, uh, you, when you get ex-sportsmen writing for a newspaper, they still have that competitive urge. So you still want to be read by more people than Michael Vaughan or you want more people to yeah. react to it or you, know, you want a bigger byline or a bigger photo picture or something. So there's, there's this sort of competitive thing still. So I think... And, you know, someone gets someone gets a better story or more access or something, you're kind of jealous. So mm. I think it depends. I mean, there are there are loads of journalists who have written for the same paper all their lives and, you know, are totally bought into that team. And there are some of us who, who try and be part of a team. And, I mean, I, I, I think I had a bad... I, I, sometimes I didn't like the people that were working on the team on my team particular newspaper so i'd give a, a, a sneaky story to somebody else on another newspaper and say well you, know, did, you didn't get it from me because there, there, there are times when it's in a text gate yeah <laughs> i mean there, there are times when as a former player um you get information which you can't really use you right. know because you feel that it's a bit disloyal to that person or something or they've told you, you know they can't you can't tell anybody so what you do is you tell somebody else um yeah, I'm sure, sure we've all done this. You tell somebody else and say it didn't come from me, you know. But I, I should have done that to my own paper. But sometimes I thought, well, actually, if I do it to my own paper, they'll know it's come from me. So I give it to somebody yeah. else on another paper. Yeah. That probably doesn't really answer your question, but it's a, it, it depends. I mean, it really depends. I, I, some newspapers are very team-orientated and some are more individual-orientated, I suppose. Yeah, for me, it's just a, it was a, it was a question more based around. Obviously, it's, it's quite a lot. So I've heard Ian Botham said it when he he did his thing about joining Sky Sports, and how he felt he left one team and walked straight into another, being surrounded by those people. Yeah, it's and different that. with broadcasting. I think TV is much more about a team, yeah. Because you, you were reliant, and actually, one of the things that really annoys me about broadcasting is that only the commentators and pundits are known as the talent, and everyone else yeah. is known as you know, the plebs, really. And actually, a lot of the real talent in TV is in production mm. rather than mm. on screen. And they don't they should be the people called the talent because some of the guys designing graphics or cutting the programme or the directors or whatever, they're, they're the talent. I mean, look at a film, a movie. I know the, the film stars will be kind of headlined, but the director is the, is the person who really has the kudos yeah. at the yeah. end of the film. And that, I think that should be much more recognised in TV sport than it is. As I uh, mentioned earlier, my, my first kind of memories of you were as, as the analyst on, you know, that 2005 Ashley series. So you've worked TV with Channel 4, uh, TMS, uh, and you've obviously, as you, as you mentioned earlier, highly successful uh, podcast, The Analyst Inside Cricket. How, how easy did you find it take, making that transition originally from print to, to then... Uh, video to now, you know, in the age of podcasts, running doing stuff more behind a microphone uh, in, in the kind of voice sector? Um, I think I probably had an advantage in that I came from an acting family. Okay. Uh, my dad was an actor, quite a successful actor. And so the whole thing about sort of voice projection and being on TV and knowing how to sort of handle yourself a bit was something that came sort of fairly naturally to me just because my dad had done it for so long and and my sister also is a TV presenter, Bethany Hughes, so it's in the family a bit. Mm. Um, so, and the other thing is, I think if you've got a passion for something, that's all you need to do is, is just be passionate and it can be quite infectious and quite compelling. So really all I did was, and, and you, you need to know your subject and I think I, I found I think the niche uh, that niche of, of doing the analyst in in a truck on cricket was was the perfect thing for me because I'd spent quite a lot of my career 
talking to people about the game and inviting people who didn't understand cricket to a game and mm. pointing out stuff and explaining it. And I was challenged. I used to find it quite challenging, quite um, you know, motivating meeting someone who said cricket's boring. I don't like it. I'd say, well, I'll prove it isn't. <laughs> so uh, it was it was a natural progression that really. And I, I, one other thing I'd say is that it's much easier to become a broadcaster if you've been a writer first because you've been used to using words and descriptions and you've thought about things and you can tell a story, I suppose. Mm. So I think most of the best commentators, Michael Atherton would be an obvious example, Mark Nicholas would be another, NASA to an extent because, you know, he, he doesn't actually write but he sort of dictates mostly so again he's thinking about writing even if he's not actually doing it himself those make the best commentators yeah that, that sort of talking about the um that move into podcasts and stuff leads us nicely onto the the next sort of step where you've you've got a new another new idea not just another new book which is the world's best cricket club yeah it wasn't my idea for the name actually <laughs> uh, some <laughs> some mad guy came up with that uh, but yeah i well no, I just that that came about because I felt a li really sorry for especially club cricketers who denied half the season in 2020 and then you know locked down again and uh, no opportunity to go to the club or have indoor nets or go to the pub with your club mates or whatever. So I thought, well, how can we? And also, I knew there was a lot of players knocking around with nothing much to do. So I thought, well, how can we? Um, harness that uh so and obviously we're all getting used to zoom calls and everyone's stuck at home with nothing to do so i created the idea of interviewing a player on zoom and getting people to pay for it and the money went to a charity so then what charity um professional cricketers trust is a charity that's really struggled to raise funds over the last year or two because there's we haven't been able to do events and more and more cricketers are experiencing, you know, mental health issues because they're not, they're, you know, the future's uncertain. They haven't been able to practice. They haven't been able to go away in the winter. You know, contracts have been terminated. People in the, in on trial haven't been able to prove themselves because they weren't able to play. You know, so many issues like that. So I just thought, well, let's try and see if it works. Um, we'll get the players on. And actually... The fact that the players know that it's for the trust that supports their profession, I think, also helps. Yeah. So it sort of, yeah, it, it came together. I mean, it's been quite hard getting members to pay £6 a month for live events, and that's four live events for £6, because I think people are you know, partly fatigued by Zoom or they just don't see why they should pay when there's so much free out there. Mm. So, which is a shame, yeah. actually, because we put a lot into it and and the players put a lot into it and they really enjoy it. And, uh, you know, we, we could do more than we are for the charity if we got a few more members. Mm. Well, I think that's something that we would certainly implore our uh, Slugging It um, audience to, to certainly check out. Um, I mean, you can hear already and, and we'll no doubt already know about Simon's... Um, incredible knowledge of the game and you know who wouldn't who wouldn't see value in you know listening to their their heroes past and present talk about you know the modern day game and everything else that we all love about the game um obviously uh, now editor-in-chief um of the cricketer magazine uh, you wrote an article about men uh you know back in the in your playing days let's say had a real tough shell and that may be showing um it was seen as a show of weakness, let's say, to maybe uh, to, to not have you that full metal jacket on at all times, as it were. Um, you have quite a story uh, about arriving late to a photo shoot in 1990. We know you've got another story we're going to ask you about in a minute. Uh, can you first of all tell us about the, 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 the reaction of the lads? In that yeah. yeah, so it was uh, April 1990. Actually, it was April 1991. It was April 1991. And um, always at the beginning of April, there was a photo shoot to get the press on to meet the new players and you know, get some quotes from the captain. And if you'd won anything the year before, 
put the trophy on show. And this was a big one because we'd just won the championship in 1990. And so it was a big photo shoot with the team all assembled in front of the trophy and then quotes and all that. And I was late. I was an hour late. Now, there was a good reason for that. And that is because uh, I'd been married about a year and we'd been having a little bit of sort of marital problems over the winter. And at the end of March, basically my wife told me that she was having an affair and she wanted to end the marriage. And, we, you know, so we tried to sort of deal with it for a few days, but eventually it, it proved to be, you know, in, in solvable. So on the morning of this photo shoot, she moved out. And wow. so, and it was, the, it was the final rites, really, of the marriage. So I felt we had to kind of, you know, close the deal, really. Mm. So hence I was late for the photo shoot. And I got there. And they were all lined up, you know, ready. And I think Mike Gadding said, you know, where the hell have you been? Because I had a bad reputation for punctuality, I have to say. <laughs> and I just stared at him completely stony face and said, don't you start. I've got a good reason. And they were like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, what is it then? So well, my wife's just left me for another man. And they stared and there was a bit of a silence. And then someone said... Well, you're not exactly Richard Gear, are you? <laughs> and I, I mean, I mean, oh God, I had to laugh, and everyone did. After a bit of sort of aghast reaction from people that how could somebody say that? Uh, yeah, everybody just buckled with laughter. I mean, I laughed, and everyone else laughed, and so that diffused it. But there's no doubt it affected me through the whole season, and I couldn't really get anything together and at the end of the season which was a you know not a particularly good season from my point of view um I, I was released I don't blame my ex-wife for that um you know these things happen but there's no doubt you it does it's very destabilizing and I had nobody to talk to about it at all so yeah it's quite it is quite hard to, to handle that kind of thing but you know we it, 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 I'm not trying to say it's a sob story, but, but there was no, there was no one to talk to about it then, and luckily now there is generally. That's exactly what I was going to say. Is, is is that I think the support structure that's now in place for the professional cricketer of, of of today's era compared to the way it was, and you know, it must it must have been extremely difficult back then because you you were seen to be you know this hard shell of, of people that you couldn't really you know say anything with, and you just had to sort of go with the flow, I guess. Um. It, it, taking on that, I mean, you know, it was interesting talking to you off air about an experience that, um, you know, you had when you went to South Africa and you were signed mm. for Northern Transvaal. And mm. to some degree, you experienced possibly, you know, um, bubble fatigue, if we can call it that, albeit, mm. you know, you were you were in your own bubble because you were in a predominantly Afrikaans, um, you know, area where with, with, with very few English people to talk to. Yeah, I, I think it was it was because... I it was just after leaving university and it was it was sort of my first entry into the big wide world really you know universities as Mike Gatting used to call it effing butlins um, <laughs> university and I mean it is a laugh really um but suddenly you play a season of cricket and then you're out in the big wide world in South Africa living in Pretoria in a one bedroom flat no phone no friends girlfriend in another part of the world Parents, obviously, back in England, no teammates, everybody speaking Afrikaans. Also, playing a very high level of cricket, the Curry Cup, which in those days had all the top South Africans who at the time were obviously isolated from Test cricket, so they played every game. So it was Barry Richards, Mike Proctor, and Clive Rice, and Graham Pollock, an absolute legend. And, you know, many other amazing cricketers. And suddenly you're pitched into that group as the overseas pro you know the English pro is going to kind of you know win the game so there was a lot of there was a lot of pressure and I I, I felt really isolated and quite alone actually and after two months of massive pressure and just this sort of loneliness I went AWOL I booked a ticket to Malaysia from Johannesburg 
and went to visit my girlfriend who was staying with her parents in Malaysia and told a lie about it, um, you know, said I was ill and got in there in those days without track and trace and mobile phones and stuff that they couldn't really prove I wasn't ill somewhere uh, up country, you know. So I came back after two weeks, felt refreshed, felt fantastic. They didn't really believe my story and over time it leaked out. But uh, actually the players were really good, but the press, I got vilified by the press who sort of sussed it out and, uh, you know, English pros are a waste of space and all that. And um, it was it was pretty horrible. And again, you know, it was a, it was a t- stupid thing to do. I'm very disloyal, and I suppose whether this was whether it was just whether it was mental health or just total insanity, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it is similar to what people are, are going through at the minute. You find people making rush decisions, don't you, and daft things about what they what they think is the right thing to do, and that's. But that's because they don't feel they can talk to the right people. If you if you'd have felt in a position where you could have talked to that team and gone, look, I'd, I'd need a bit of help here, but that wasn't wasn't kind of what was available at the time, was it? Mm. True. Um, it's a good holiday, though. <laughs> Sorry, it's a good holiday. <laughs> I had a good holiday, yeah. but yeah, it wasn't really the kind yeah. of thing to do. That's the main thing. Um, twenty twenty was obviously a quite a tough year for cricket. Um, given everything that went off but 2021 is looking a bit brighter we hope with a bit of a vaccine and stuff what does 2021 hold for simon hughes and the cricket in world do we think um well uh, there's two things i'd say one is that i'm very excited to be involved in making a documentary about england winning the world cup and it's taken a year to get together uh, the finance and the permission the buy-in and all that, but we've now got all that, and so I'm working in a small team to produce a, a cinematic celebration of England winning the World Cup. Not really so much about the game, although the game is is a prominent part of it, but more about the characters and the team and the diversity of the team and the way they turned it round from 2015 being absolutely yeah. useless to... Yeah. <laughs> to 2019 being champions and and just just getting into the personalities of the players and their family backgrounds and the influence of their parents and their their home school their their schooling and you know their their home environment really to try and show how cricket is the, the film is called the working title is the greatest game and we're trying to show through this film why cricket is the greatest game because it just draws all these diverse characters together um, and the other thing I'm trying to do is is help the BBC, uh, and, and this is something I haven't really embarked on yet, but is help the BBC explain the game better to a wider audience by using digital platforms and various techniques like you know like podcasts and video casts and graphics and just kind of trying to enhance the digital coverage of the game to draw more people in. Simon, it's, that's been an absolute joyful 45 minutes yeah. for me. I could literally sit here and talk to you about cricket for a month. Well, that's nice. I could uh, me the same. It sounds it sounds like you never stop working as it is. So we're probably yeah we'll have to kind of leave it there for the time being. I think um, as we mentioned to you earlier, we do um, have these five questions for you. We're we're t- petrified that you're going to get them all right tonight, and so the Lord absolutely to- guarantee that I won't. Um, so, um, Eugene, I'm going to nominate Eugene can do the questions tonight and uh, I, I will uh, confirm or deny whether you've got them right. Sounds good. So, Simon, question number one. What is your highest list A score? List A score. 22 not out. 53. It was your only professional half century. No, he said list A. Oh, oh! Huge! What you done? What you done? Fifty-three was my highest first-class score. Uh, well, we've got to give you twenty-two. That, I don't know. I don't know what my list A score, but it was about it was twenties, not very high. I think like it that. was twenty-two, not out. Right. So okay. I've typed the question correctly oh. there. Eugene, you're putting, <laughs> you're putting an extra two quid in for that, Chief. Yeah, I was going to say. Well organised. Number two, huge. 
Uh, how many catches did you take across your first class and your list A? So your two. Um, 110. Not bad, 80. Oh, okay. That's wrong then. This is, probably, <laughs> this is probably one that I expected you not to get, but who knows how we're going to get there. How many balls did you bowl in your first class career? About 30,000. Oh, I'll tell you what, that's a fine... We know, I mean, what we is the normally, answer? We normally give a couple of thousand uh, leeway, in fairness. Uh, 28,984, so we'll give you that one. Well, I, I, the reason why I kind of know that roughly is because I once worked out that if you multiply those 30,000 or 29,800 by 500 kilos, which is my body weight times six or seven that equates to what pressure I put through my knee from leg, yeah, from my, from my career. And it works out as 22,000 tons. Wow. Yeah. Which is the size of, and I then, you know, took it a stage further. What boat is 22,000 tons? And it's one of those, roughly one of those ferries that goes across the channel to Brittany. Wow. Now that is a stat. So that's that what a... I put through my knee in 15 years of professional cricket, never mind all the nets as well. Did you have yeah, any all the club games? Did yeah, you I have any f- uh, yeah, I had four not and four left knee operations. Wow. Clean sort yeah. of clean outs. Yeah. That would cause it. And that's why, basically. Of those balls that you bowled in your first first class career, how many mm-hmm. wickets did you take across again? This is both formats. So this is, you know, list A and um, first class. How many wickets? Um about 750. I'm not sure exactly. 738. 738. You're, right. you're doing far too well here. <laughs> so I, I, do I get a point for that or not? Yeah, we'll give you that one. Yeah, we'll, yeah. Okay. we'll, we'll give you that and the balls. I've got uh, one non cricketing question for you, which is a little bit around the technical side of stuff. Um, what month and year did you join Twitter? 2010. Ooh. Yeah. Yes. Was it? Which month? Yeah. What month? Oh, month. Um, yeah. August. I don't yeah. know. Fe- February. I feel like oh. we have to give you that though because yeah. 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 eleven years later. Um, it, it is. It is typical. We've got the analyst come on, and he's absolutely caned all yeah. of the questions. It's yeah. easy. Well, Everyone else didn't get the. What did I? No I got one wrong, didn't I? Anyway. It's all right, Simon. Yeah. Eugene is going to send twenty pounds to the Lord's Tavern. I most definitely will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for getting the you could the question master couldn't get the question right, the answer right. Exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, so much for coming on. It I think it's a bit of a um, you know it's certainly a bucket list ticked off for for, for me and I'm sure the other two lads yeah. uh, to have the opportunity to talk to you. Um, good luck with everything. Uh, to everybody who's listening to this podcast, please make sure that you check out Simon's Twitter. Uh, the Inside Cricket uh, Analyst podcast. Uh, also, definitely check out the uh, World's Best Cricket Club uh, and, you know, some of the uh, in- incredible content that's available on there is easily worth at least... Yeah, actually, pounds. it is, because, in fact, you can go to the YouTube channel and watch some of it as well. You, there's an, there's a, the Analyst YouTube channel, and quite a lot of the interviews we did with the England players over the last three or four months is on there, actually. So there's quite a lot of interesting content. I mean, some of the guys have been... Fantastic. You know, people mm. like Josh Butler and Ian Bell actually was really good last week. We've got both of them next week. Beefy wow. doing wow. a wine tasting oh. um, on, on, and, and looking back 40 years at 1981. So that should be good. Brilliant. Is he drinking his own wine? Yes, he's drinking his own wine and telling us all about it. Oh, Thursday awesome. the 4th of Feb. Brilliant. Well, look, check check that out. Absolutely. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll love a drop. So I'll, uh, I'll certainly be checking that out. I am going to be uh, joining the world's best cricket club myself, as will uh, these two. Um, Good man. Thank you again, Mr. Hughes. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you, and we uh, yeah look forward to speaking to you again in the future. That's a great pleasure. Good to meet you all. And uh, so, following that wonderful interview with Simon Hughes, here is a note from our sponsors, Woodstock Cricket. <laughs> Looking for a new cricket equipment partner for yourself or your club can sometimes be tricky with so many options to choose from. How do you make the right choice? When you want quality, value and service, 
there really is only one place to start. For more than a decade, Woodstock Cricket have been producing award-winning, high-performance cricket bats from their Shropshire workshop. Matched with their classy soft goods, luggage and accessories, Woodstock Cricket really do tick all the boxes. Get in touch with Woodstock Cricket and find out why many loyal clubs, players and international customers can't be wrong at info at woodstockcricket.co.uk. Uh, thank you, as always, to our sponsors, Woodstock Cricket, a uh, phenomenal cricket uh, bat manufacturer and equi- uh, supplier of uh, equipment and soft goods. Uh, you should check them out, www.woodstockcricket.co.uk. Um, what an interview with Simon Hughes. I mean, it, it, as soon as he came on, he, he he said like three words and I was like, oh my God, his voice. I love his voice. Uh, I've just... I've been so used to hearing it and have just grown up with it. Um, it just put me at ease straight away. And I was like, I, I texted him afterwards. I, I said this to you too, and just said, look, thank you so much for doing that. Um, I think it was a bit of a bucket list interview for the three of us, because obviously having grown up listening to him and know all the great work he's done, it, it was an amazing experience for the three of us, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, like you say, as as I can, we, we were all sat on the, uh, on the meeting already as we are and then his his face popped up and i was like oh yeah simon hughes and like you said and then he started talking i was like oh yeah yeah there he is and it it was just but what an interesting guy like that was the the thing and um like you said it it was just a brilliant brilliant interview to interview someone who's who's seen cricket and in, a, in the way that he does when it comes in, obviously it comes across in the interview that he doesn't just look at it from a, the uh, analytics of the play inside of things, but all the other things that he's, he was involved in when it be the, the IPL or the big, um, the, the hundred, um, and, and all that kind of stuff. He's just obviously someone that is unbelievably passionate about cricket and that came across. I mean, his cricket brain huge, like, you know, for him to have been involved in, you know, setting up IPL teams and, you know, saying, you know, he actually presented the idea of the 100 to the ECB and then four years later, they've actually decided to go on to it. I thought some of the stuff that I found really refreshing, you know, he, he's very much a um, celebrity is the wrong word, but he, he's so um, recognisable within cricket and he's obviously part of the, the kind of movers and shakers of cricket, if you like. I thought it was incredible. He, he was quite honest Like when we asked him about, do we think that the 100 is the ECB's kind of um, for the sake of it style competition because they feel like they, they lost P20 and the world run away with it. And he, he answered that question very, very honestly, didn't he? Yeah, he's always thought about cricket in a very, very different way. Um, you can see from when he was playing how he used to take notes. I mean, that was really interesting. Yeah. Nobody would ever think yeah. about doing that now. Imagine sitting in a changing room during a rain break, taking notes about stuff that's happened during the... So he's always thought about it in a very different way, as Simon said. And yeah, I mean, it sounds like he's, to your point, he's been very influential in, in a lot of things to to mould, one, the way cricket has played or the game has been played. Uh, and, and then two, now, I mean, you know, the, the sort of stuff that he's doing that he mentioned, I mean, the documentary that he's now going to be involved in about, yeah, yeah. you know, the way England won their World Cup and everything, the loops and, and hoops that they had to jump through. So, yeah, what an absolutely brilliant interview. Um, he made it so easy, and I suppose... You know, that's his job. He, he knows how to do it. So he made it a little bit easier for us. It, it just sort of really flowed. I suppose the, I mean, the, the three broadcasters that we've interviewed, we, we found it very easy because they just almost, they take the pressure off us, don't they, as amateurs, I, I guess, uh, with, with Max, Toby and, and now Simon, of course. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the three of us, I mean, we've talked about it, thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it, hopefully we'll be able to get Simon on with us again in the future. Um, something that is happening tonight, if you're listening to this on Thursday, um, Simon um, has the, the world's best cricket club, uh, which is something that uh, they provide amazing amounts of content, either through YouTube. We've had some um, a load of England players on. Ian Bell was on last week, and tonight, being Thursday, they're doing an interview with Ian Botham about the 81 Ashes, 40 years on, uh, but also where Beefy will talk about his wines and his absolute love of wine and whatever. So, Please do check that out. Um, you know, we've obviously been posting about it on our socials. Um, but, yeah, if you're hearing this for the first time, get, check that out tonight because it's amazing. I think it costs you a five or whatever. Uh, but they support the Professional Cricketers Trust, which is another amazing cricket charity. 
Uh, so please do look into that. Um, he's oh, he's analyst, analyst inside cricket podcast. Obviously, you know he, he's so passionate about cricket. It's just like he thinks about it. Other than he, other than his kids and his family, that like, you know it, it's cricket, cricket, cricket. There's always like little new things that he's thinking of or, or whatever. You. Like and he he just seems to be so determined to to offer something back to cricket and people who love cricket. It, it was really refreshing to hear that. Yeah, I mean, he's he's obviously got a huge passion for it, hasn't he? And and that's that comes across when you speak to him, and that clearly comes across in everything that he does. He's, I mean, I bet he wishes when he was setting up the IPL side and all that kind of stuff, he, he to quit in the shares pot or something. But um, <laughs> not, I'm sure he's not shy of a bob or two. But like, you, you know what I mean? Um, he, yeah, he, he's just really, really passionate. You get the feeling he's quite competitive as well, like when we spoke about the um, going into print and that type of stuff. Um, but yeah, he's just, he's still got that desire that burns. That I mean, we're all passionate about cricket. Um, we've decided to do this. Eugene, I know, runs sort of three or four podcasts and he's decided to start multi-million pound franchise-based stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> late to him, but you can't. And then, like, if someone like that who thinks about it that way, he's it, it, just incredible, just absolutely incredible. The stuff he's done. I heard a story, and I didn't ask him this at the time, that he pitched the idea of the analyst to Channel Four. They loved it, and then asked him to do it. Now I don't know if that's true, but that was a story that I heard before the two thousand five Ashes. Mm. So, yeah, and I mean, he obviously can't be that big into his stats because he didn't get a lot of his questions right. Well, he did. Especially the ones I didn't answer. The way well, yeah. I didn't ask correctly. Yeah, Eugene ended up putting uh, 20, 20 sheets in. Well, no, um, I, mean, I have to put 20 sheets in, you mean? That's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be doing that. I, I got one question wrong. He got three right and he answered one correct incorrectly. So I'll have you know, it's just one question. I'll get off my soapbox now. I bet there properly. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the two stories, I mean, you know, we we asked him. Uh, we were going to ask him one question about mental health, uh, which was the thing about you know when he, he talked about when his when his wife had, had left him, um, and, and you know this outward you know having to outwardly be tough in front of um, you know your teammates and you know your um, compatriots in that in that kind of time. Um, but then you know before we actually went on air, he actually offered the other story to us, didn't he, about what went on in South Africa and the fact that he felt very um, isolated, no phone and all that, and so just took himself off to uh, Malaysia, which is where his girlfriend was with her parents and all that, and then he came back and the press absolutely vilified him. So um, it's the, the the written press, or you know, the press in, as, a, as a whole, it's not a new thing that they will kind of take aim at people. Uh, it's something that he experienced as, as far back as the 80s. Yeah, I mean, it's, a similar, it's a similar situation that we can kind of relate to as what people are going through now. That's feeling isolated, feeling like you're not part of anything, you're not seeing anyone, you're not doing anything. And and that's, it was, for, for me, it was just expressed that at the minute, you've got to try and find your outlets. And I know it's difficult to find him. He managed to find it by flying to Malaysia to go and see his, his, his then partner or girlfriend. Or, and like, that's, that was his way of dealing with it. But it, it's, it, if anything, it's the closest story we've heard in the 11 episodes to to a situation that is somewhat comparable to what the world's going through at the minute. I mean, it's not comparable because at the minute you can't jump on a flight to Malaysia. But by the same token, there's so many aspects of it, it's isn't it? Yeah, yeah there's, there's so many aspects of it that are. Um, so yeah, it's just it's just brilliant that he opened up and, like, say he led that. We didn't we didn't know that he led that, and I think that's such a good thing that certainly the guests that we're having are doing there. We're finding they're leading these conversations, so it's must. It, it's we're getting somewhere. I think we, we're making progress, and if we can get the guests to open up, that's no reason that listeners can't open up. I think huge that um, I, I was just going to mention that that I think Simon when he came on, we we kind of talked him through what we'd be talking about. There'd have been a couple of emails, but you know, previous to that between him and myself. Um, but I think that. Um, you know, guests seem to be enjoying their experience when they come on, don't they? Because we do our research and we kind of talk to them, you know, and I think we almost surprised 
Simon a little bit by the fact that, you know, because he will get asked to do a lot of these things and, you know, we, we managed to get him onto a, a, a mutual contact. Um, but I think, you know, having spoken to him afterwards, uh, he, 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 I think he thoroughly enjoyed it, um, which, which was great because I think we were all a little bit, not nervous, but because he, he was someone that we really wanted to interview and he because he was, so, you know, a, a name and, and obviously thinks about the game so um, greatly that you know uh, that was that was really kind of proud thing for us I think to to realise that he, he he'd enjoyed his time on the pod with us. Yeah, I, I think you know from our perspective it's great to interview somebody of his caliber, especially in the in the media world, and hopefully he enjoyed it. Um, you know, he said that it, yeah it was it was good fun and he enjoyed meeting us, so so hopefully that's a positive thing. But I suppose you know more importantly it's just you know we're, we're, we're anybody else looking to come on um, because we are going to get clubbies on and. We're not there to catch you, you know. We're not there yeah, to yeah. catch you out or talk about anything negative. All we want to do is just have a, a good conversation. You know, we're doing this so that we have fun. We're not doing this out there to, as the South African press uh, did to him when he was playing for Northern Transvaal to try and catch him out about where he was in, was he in Malaysia? Was he in, you know? From our perspective, we just want to we just want to enjoy ourselves as much as um, as much as they enjoy themselves. And I think it was interesting with the way you finished off the comment. There's like it feels like this is work again, and we're going to let you go. You probably find we would have carried on talking, and I think he did say that he'd carry on talking mm. for us for the next you know yeah. two hours on cricket if we if we could. But yeah, I mean, I, I, it was a great conversation. It's one of those where you're pleasantly surprised at the end of it, where you go, I enjoyed that thoroughly. It was uh, yeah. it was like scoring a hundred. Wow, I, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I need to say it's really enjoyable. Actually, it's a really nice feeling. Um, so, um, but yeah, one day, mate. So, so he's playing at Lords, John Over, and I didn't want to bring that up during the Simon Hughes interview. All oh, right, okay, fine. Yeah, well, well done, mate. There's been two. I, I mean, you two have been hungry tonight. There's been nom 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 <laughs> nom. Been a lot of eating on the pod tonight. This is. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and on that note, um, gentlemen, thank you as always for your time, um, committed to, to putting this together. Guys, thanks again for for, for joining us. Don't forget, um, follow us on our socials. There's loads of content coming out through Instagram, uh, Facebook. There's the Big Smoke Big Nights in. That's every Friday at 8 o'clock. Um, don't forget to register your interest or get in touch about the golf day and uh, and or the Slogging It Cricket 11 days. Um, but yeah, uh, don't forget YouTube. Uh, we're, we're all all of the uh, pods are shown uh, are on our channel there as well. Um, but yeah, thanks again for tuning in. And uh, until next week, we will say goodbye and good night. See you later. Cheers, guys. Have a good one.